This is an episode of Reasonably Sound Classic. For the first 30-some episodes, this podcast was distributed by Infinite Guest, American Public Media's podcast network. Thus, it benefited from blanket broadcast licenses held with every music publisher. After going independent, pretty much all intro, outro, and interstitial music had to be removed. The intro and outro music you're going to hear is an in-progress version of Reasonably Sound's theme, written by Will Stratton. The awkward silences are where act break music used to be, so if you could just imagine like Queen or The Misfits or Kate Bush along the way, that would be great. If you want to support Reasonably Sound in the hopes that maybe one day I'll be able to afford some blanket licenses of my own, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Okay, on with the show. Hey everyone, just a small bit of news before we get started. In case you missed all of the announcements, Reasonably Sound now has a Patreon. So if you like the podcast and want to support it, I would love to have you as part of the growing community of patrons we have. You can find Reasonably Sound's Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. All spelled out, no hyphens. Come hang out. The last time I went to the doctor, which was about, I don't know, maybe a year ago, well, which reminds me, note to self, make a doctor's appointment. My doc, who's a younger guy, real nice, uh, takes only one week off every year to go to San Diego Comic Con. We normally have pretty long and protracted conversations about Deadpool or whatever Matt Fraction might currently be up to, more so than we might talk about my health, which I suppose is actually probably a pretty positive thing. Anyway, the last time I went to the doctor, during the more hands-on portion of my physical, the doc laid me back, he jabbed his fingers into my side, it didn't hurt, but it was a pretty firm poke, and he started banging on his own knuckles. One hand firmly pressed into my kidney, the other rapping on the second knuckle of that hand, and him staring off into space, listening. He'd move his hand around a little bit, give it another whack, nod slightly, and move on. After a solid minute of this, he stopped, wrote something on his clipboard. I imagine while thinking about, I don't know, Thor, maybe? If you don't mind me asking, I started to ask anyway, what was that all about? He explained that it's a pretty old medical technique, not widely currently taught, and it was at this moment, as if the comic book obsession and ukulele hanging on the wall were not indication enough, that I realized my doctor is not only a hipster, but also a hipster doctor, in all three senses of that phrase. It's a way to tell how much fluid is in certain parts of the body, he explained. And he said that roughly, mostly, healthy organs are resonant. When you jam a finger into them and then knock on that finger, there's a little bit of a drum sound to it, like a membrane stretched over an empty cavity. Tired, diseased, or malfunctioning organs sound different. They sound, well dead, for lack of a better word. If they're filled with fluid, they don't resonate well. Turns out that all of those metaphors for your body being in tune may resonate after all. So, but anyway, I wanted to prod Doc for more information on the process and the different sounds of the different organs, but you know how doctors are. They're busy and overbooked, and you're lucky if you get a chance to ask them about their favorite superheroes for even five minutes, so you have to use your time wisely. Mostly the experience, though, it revealed to me something that I never really considered. The acoustic space that is my body. Normally, it's easy to get caught up in the acoustic spaces around our bodies, the acoustic spaces that we experience or inhabit. But what about your own fleshy bits and stuff as acoustic space? What about listening to your body as an environment? I mean, sure, your stomach may grumble or your ears may ring. You may have a cough or a sniffle, but these things are sonically significant in that they are aberrations in some way. They're diversions from the norm. What about the totality of the acoustic space which is represented in the normally functioning body? How do we listen to that and create meaning from it? We're going to start with one way that I know lots about, electronic music. And then we're going to end on one that I know 
pretty much nothing about actual medicine as practiced by professionals. In 2001, House and soon-to-be big band producer Matthew Herbert released a record called Bodily Functions. This was at the zenith, or perhaps just past the zenith, or zenith, I guess, of sampling culture. A time when everything in popular music, or popular music as I knew it, at least, was made of loops and samples. Samplers, in the wake of the Wu-Tang Clan and DJ Shadow, the Avalanches, and DJ Spooky, took on some kind of mythical status. This happened co-temporally with the digital audio workstation, aka computers, rise to its status as widely distributed and popularly understood inheritor of magnetic tapes legacy for better or worse. But still, there was a time where computers, with software that allowed one to make music and a record industry still working by and large on magnetic tape and samplers, a piece of music gear which allows one to record some small snippet of sound and assign it to a key on a physical controller of some kind, they all coexisted. Now, as far as my experience of them in their heyday and already one foot into their demise at the hands of, you know, computers. The sampler was a digital audio workstation before there were digital audio workstations, but it was also something different. Digital audio workstations would eventually come to represent it all. Recording, mixing, mastering, arranging, editing, writing. The sampler was a much more pure machine. You fed the world to it and it spit it back out, triggered by drum pads or piano keys, stretched or compressed, pitched up or down, depending. Now, I had a sampler before I had a computer that could make music, and it stood, as far as I was concerned at least, for the possibility that anything could become music. I recorded doors closing and books shuffling around, my keys jangling, footsteps, and even the automatic garage door opener. At the time, my sampler wasn't really a way to make music for the world, it was a way to make the world into music. And also, as a very, very brief digression, I don't mean to suggest that samplers as a piece of gear have completely disappeared. You can still buy them, and several companies, Teenage Engineering and Electron come right to mind, make modern samplers that are great. They just don't occupy nearly the cultural cachet, or trigger, pun intended, the same gear lust as they did in the 90s through early 2000s, with companies like Roland, Emu, and Akai, with their MPC being somewhat ever-present, depending upon your scene of choice. At this point, I think it's safe to say that the sampling slash looping phase has mostly passed and we're back to being focused on straight up synthesis. Anyway, 2001, Matthew Herbert releases Bodily Functions, a record which took very seriously and personally the capability of the sampler to turn the world into music. Herbert, the story goes, recorded much of his daily routine and much of the acoustic space of his body, brushing his teeth, eating, knuckles cracking, gurgling, thumping, wheezing, beating, and so on. He then sequenced those sounds into his record, a part of songs written at very reasonable BPMs featuring jazz kit drums and upright basses, nice mellow organ sounds, and in my opinion, just the right amount of purely electronic instrumentation. Most songs feature the voice of Danny Siciliano and lyrics dealing with privacy, proximity, the known and unknown of one's own body and the bodies of others, intimacy, and of course, schedule, addiction, so on, so forth. Body stuff, bodily functions. And what happens with the bodily sounds, Herbert samples and sequences throughout the record is kind of, it's, it's kind of actually exactly what you'd expect. It's that same cliche thing that we're confronted with whenever we're presented with a work of art that exposes something of our own interior. That happens whenever we talk about the body as the most unfamiliar, familiar space. You get to hear how alien it is. The squishing and clicking and whatever else gets mixed up and in with the bass lines and drum beats of the record, the vocals, and all the rest of the orchestration, as it might in the course of our own embodied experience of those sounds. Except sans instruments and avec meat, I guess. 
These sounds are attenuated by our own environment and bodily construction, muffled and hidden from us, though in a weird way they are us. Your own knuckle cracking and stomach growling, you'll hear without problems, sure, but when they're disembodied, sampled, they're given a kind of sonic perspective, tough if not impossible to get while doing double duty as both performer and audience. I don't know about you, but the sound of other people's knuckles cracking always weirds me out. It just, it just doesn't sound right. Anyway, this whole arrangement thus prevents us from getting a really close listen to our own acoustic space, even though we are literally it, or I guess maybe inside it. All these sounds become weirdly recognizable and weirdly foreign which was, I'm sure, the exact aim of what is essentially a jazz record made by a then well-known house producer, straddling all kinds of lines here, all over the place. While Apple Music's little blurb describes Herbert's record as, quote, a sentimental gem for lovers and dreamers, the kind of album Rainy Saturdays were made for, on some level, it's also a horror show. It's a weirdly twee, kind of almost gruesome and here we may pause momentarily for two digressions in one section, which may be a new reasonably sound record, I'm not sure. We shouldn't go any further without acknowledging outright the Motmos record, A Chance to Cut is a Chance to Cure, also from 2001. This record, in my estimation, is high church of sample mania, as is much of Motmos's work. If you're unfamiliar, they're most well known for basically constructing situations and then recording the outcomes of those situations to then sequence into their particular brand of music concrete meets dance music. Like, picture uh, a jar of snails, and on one side of the jar of snails, an array of very bright lights, and on the other side of the jar of snails, an array of photosensitive resistors, so that as the snails move and shafts of light creep through the jar, they shine on those resistors, and the resistors control a circuit which produces sound. This is an actual thing that Motmos did for one of their records. So, in a chance to cut, Drew and Martin, the two members of Motmos, they didn't sample bodily sounds as such, but rather a number of surgical processes, liposuction, LASIK eye surgery, the sawing of bones, and so on. They then sequenced those sounds into a record that occasionally resembles, but on the whole could really be considered almost an opposite of Herbert's, more rigid, often more challenging, and significantly more electronic. It dips into jazzy, loungy areas and a bit into the dance music idiom, but mostly it doesn't really set up shop in those places. Moreover, A Chance to Cut is about things that happen to bodies, not necessarily the bodies themselves. The record is as mechanical and surgical, yeah, I know, as the processes they recorded to make it. But even so, much like bodily functions, it does have this not nauseating, but also not not nauseating quality about it. But I mean, it also, it works, it's entertainment. I might be slightly horrified by the subject matter, but the subject matter is not actually horrific. It's what philosopher Noel Carroll might call art horrific. And actually, I think the effectiveness of Herbert's and Motmos's records is related to one of the reasons viscera in horror films is so effective. The reason seeing human insides is so awful and also so satisfying is that one is confronted with the alien nature of their own interior. The physical space, as opposed to the acoustic space of one's insides, is mortifying on one level in that the sight of it signifies mortal danger, but also because we're shown just how unconnected we are to our own interiors. These records, like My Doctor's Knocking and that scene in Shaun of the Dead where David gets torn all to bits, they provide access to some previously unhad knowledge about our own bodies. Unhad, I guess, unless you're a doctor, or Matthew Herbert, or Motmos or a zombie.
Speaking of doctors, the use of percussion, as it's called in examination or as a diagnostic technique, has been around for quite a while, but was introduced to modern medicine by an 18th century Austrian physician by the name of Leopold Arnbrugger. After having experimented on a good number of cadavers, Arnbrugger showed that one could reliably measure the amount of liquid present in an interior bodily cavity by placing one finger over the area in question and wrapping on it with another. Today, the kinds of sounds produced by certain fluid and not fluid filled portions of the body have been sorted, of course, into a taxonomy. They are tympanic or drum-like, that's what Doc explained to me during my physical, hyper-resonant, which is exactly what it sounds like when the percussed cavity resonates significantly. There's something called a coin test where a doctor may tap two coins on a patient's chest. I imagine one laying flat on the surface of the chest and then the other tapping on that coin though I could be wrong here. And then if the tapping hyper resonates in that patient's chest cavity, for instance, there's a chance that the patient has a collapsed lung. Third is normal resonance, which is the sound made by a normal healthy chest cavity when percussed. Impaired resonance is a slightly duller version of the same, and dull percussion is exactly what it sounds like little to no percussive qualities. A dull-sounding liver might be normal, whereas a dull lung could indicate a buildup of tissue or fluid. Percussion as a technique is part of a larger set of practices known as auscultation. Generally, auscultation is the practice of listening to the interior of the body, specifically the respiratory, gastrointestinal, and circulatory systems, blood, guts, and breaths. Now, I could talk for days about the sounds of each of these systems, and actually, I kind of hope to someday. So instead of going into great detail on the particular sonic events that are possible or likely to be found around said blood and guts, we're going to wrap up this episode by talking briefly about where auscultation comes from. So, remember our friend Leopold Auenbrugger, popularizer of percussion in medicine? His work ended up having some influence on a French gentleman who went by the name of... Uh-oh. Okay, here we go. René Theophile Hyacinth Lenec. I think I got that right. Lenec not only coined the term auscultation from the Latin auscultare, to listen, he also invented a very well-known medical instrument, the stethoscope. Well, sort of. In the way everything old is new and everything new is old, there's reason to believe that there were things like stethoscopes or materials and arrangements of objects with the same basic purpose as a stethoscope going way, way, way back. But as far as it is generally taught and understood in the medical profession in the West and maybe elsewhere, I'm not sure, Lenek, he invented the stethoscope. The story goes like this. He was walking around one day in 1816 after having a particularly rough go at diagnosing a particular patient. This patient was a young woman, which made the process of, quote, direct auscultation, or putting his ear on her body, out of the question. Considering his predicament, needing some time to reflect, Lenek goes for a walk. He ends up in the park where he espies some children playing with sticks or logs or hollow wooden pieces. I've seen it reported several different ways. Anyway, he's reminded, maybe by the activity of the children, maybe just in general, that if one scratches on one side of a small piece of wood, one is able to hear that scratching on the other side if their ear is pressed up against it. It's also probably worth noting Lenek played the flute. So, reminded of the transmissive properties of certain materials, Lenek, back with his patient, tested his idea with a stack of paper. Rolled into a tight cylinder, he pressed the paper into the young woman's chest near her heart, and Eureka, or I guess, voila, was able to, quote, perceive the action of the heart in a manner much more clear and distinct than I had ever been able to do by the immediate application of my ear. Lenek made a few stethoscopes after that, the first being essentially a wooden tube. Models made of various materials, some tubular, some shaped remarkably like toilet plungers, would follow, made by many people the world around. But much like Auenbrugger's percussion techniques, Lenek's stethoscope wouldn't get significant traction in the medical community until years later. Lenek died in 1826 of tuberculosis, and it wasn't until the 1850s that what you or I would readily recognize as a stethoscope went into production. 
Irish physician Arthur Lyrid invented a binaural stethoscope in 1851, and one year later, George Kamen, an American doctor based in New York City, solidified the design for the instrument as we know it. A piece of acoustically conductive material is placed on the patient's body, and sound is conducted through the material and into hollow tubes made of rubber and or metal to the wearer's ears. Modern acoustic stethoscopes have what are called chest pieces with two sides, a diaphragm for listening to low frequency sounds like heartbeats and a bell for listening to higher frequency sounds like vibrations on the skin. Now, there's lots to say about stethoscopes, how they work, the different kinds, electronic, fetal, Doppler, but rather than go into all of the details, I'd much rather end on one sort of broad stethoscopic point, as made by Tom Rice in his paper Sounding Bodies, Medical Students and the Acquisition of Stethoscopic Perspectives from the Oxford Handbook of Sound Studies. Pulling from a few other sources, Rice says that, quote, the stethoscope is the doctor's, quote, symbol of office, end quote, and listening provides an opportunity for doctors to express what, following Bordeaux, might be described as their key professional dispositions, concern, responsibility, and so on. Furthermore, the chest, and especially the heart, are popularly regarded in the West as the seat of life. A person listening to the heart and having medical power in relation to it is accorded a particular prestige among both medical professionals and patients." End quote. Now, I remember as a kid always being fascinated by stethoscopes, knowing roughly what they did, but not exactly how they worked, and being flummoxed that when my doctor would let me wear his, they didn't just make everything louder. To me, the stethoscope was a mysterious kind of almost magical item, sort of like the sampler, but wielded by doctors in this case. It allowed them to peer inside the human body without actually peering, without getting into all that alien gunk. And along Rice's line, it too also signaled their authority and care. You want to convey scientist on a TV show? You put someone in a lab coat. You want to convey working doctor? Put him in a lab coat and hang a stethoscope around their neck. Now, I would be lying if I said that I didn't kind of love the fact that what is effectively a piece of sound equipment has such a strong association with saving lives. My name is Mike Rugnetta, and this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at ReasonablySND, and you can find me, Mike Rugnetta, on Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, and Snapchat at Mike Rugnetta. Mike Rugnetta.